9 o'clock, so we'll try to get started. And I've asked Brother Fudge if he would to lead us in prayer to get us started, so we'll, uh, we'll do that this time. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this time that we can assemble together, study from your word, come to you in prayer. We're thankful, Father, for your son that died on the cross that we might have hope of eternal life. May we study our lessons today in such a way that it can help us to learn more about your word so that we can attain that hope. We pray that you be with the teachers in all the classes this morning. May they teach in a way that the students will easily understand what is being taught. Help us always to live our lives in such a way that we will be an example to others as we go about our day-to-day lives. Be with us through these classes this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. As is normal, we will go uh, over our questions from the last lesson. Of course, we were not here last week. We had our meeting. And what a good meeting it was. Um, But we did not have class. And so uh, maybe this will help knock the rust off. Uh, going into the next lesson. So, record keepers, where did we get to? I, I hear it was a McCluskey. What? Who? Oh, it's Leon, sir. So we completed the McCluskeys. We always make sure we say their name right at that moment. Uh, so, and if that's the case, then we will go back to Leon, and you can probably answer it straight off the board, Leon, if you need to. I always catch people unawares. That's what I, I try to do. Where did the material for the tabernacle come from? And this was considered spoils from Egypt as they left. The Egyptians gave them generously uh, precious stone, gold, cloths, all manner of goods. That's correct. So the spoils that they collected from Egypt that we were told about uh, earlier in the book uh, here, they collect them. And we'll be using them in a the tavern. All right, number two. Miss uh, Linda? Uh, Alicia, do you have number two? There we go. All that they needed and more, right? They, uh, in fact, they had to tell them, stop bringing things. That's how generous the people were at that moment. All right, number three. Yeah, uh, yeah, Kea, Acacia, uh, however the proper pronunciation would be, which I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, we actually talked a little bit about that wood, didn't we? It's, it's a neat wood. All right, number four. Uh, I guess we'll come on back over here. Uh, Greg? Okay, yeah, so there are several layers, and each layer seemed to serve a purpose um, with that, and because I, I know I had never really realized how many layers there were involved, but, um, but yeah, that was, so uh, we had four, I think four total layers there of uh, different coverings. All right, Nancy? Silver, and each one was, what, 70 pounds of silver? And we had a, a lot of them. I think about 100, roughly 100 of them, if I remember right. All right. Uh, Miss Cindy, you got yours? You, all right. Uh, either one of the Isbels. Uh, what was the design woven and rotor into the linen? Uh, cherubims? Cherubims, yes. Yes. And we do have some descriptions of cherubims in a couple places, don't we? All right. Next. Right, 150 feet by 75, 70, 75 feet. All right, next. What was used to cover the Ark of the Covenant for transportation, transport, uh, covering the veil? That's right, the veil, yeah. And uh, that's very logistically handy, but also significant as well. It maintains that separation of the presence of God from 
the people. And so uh, I, if I had, had ever studied that and noticed that before, I had forgotten it, that the veil was actually what was used to put over the ark. All right, next. That's right. That's right. So everything was suspended by a pole and the lampstand in the bag. All right. Uh, number 10. What was not to be used with the special hand sanitary personal use was considered to be a holy rule? Yes, it was a holy recipe. So this was not for common everyday use. All right. Break, Lauren. So they were inspired workmen. Uh, holy of the do what? Also holy of the there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, I think he was of Dan. Right. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, Mom? Or did you have? Okay, Mom. That's it. That's right. So I didn't have a sp specific scripture because there was, this was an absence question, right? But that's exactly what I was, I was looking for. The, the, the image of God is not found. Remember the second commandment. We don't make an image even of Jehovah. Even of Jehovah, there is no image to be made. So yes, you did not find an image of Jehovah. And so what was unique about this? What was... I mean... Uh, well, okay, let me just go where I'm going. Uh, but you won't find this anywhere else, any other nation. You, you, they had an image. They had something physical there of their God, and this was not. This was all to our God, for our God, but there was no image of our God here. And so that was unique among the nations that they would not have uh, an image of. No idol. Yeah, no idol, right. No, um, no physical thing to represent. Um, some shape, form, or fashion, yeah, right. All right, so now we are in our final lesson of uh, Exodus. And uh, so to bring us along our journey, if we remember our map, we've been on this map for several lessons now. We have not made any changes to our lesson because we've been in the same place. We have not moved. As a nation, we have not moved uh, from Mount Sinai for quite a while, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, toward the end of our lesson. Um, and so here we are, we are at Mount Sinai, and uh, Leon, I'm trying to get some mileage out of that picture. Um, but we, uh, we're sitting here at Mount Sinai, we have been here a while, we've received, um, the, the people have received the law, it's been ratified, it's already been broken. Um, we uh, uh, but God has, uh, uh, Moses interceded. God has decided to be with them and tells them he will go continue with them on their journey. And so then we went back and looked at the details that were given up on the mountain. Uh, the, our last class, of course, we went, as we saw in the questions, we went through the tabernacle with pretty, pretty decent detail. And then uh, what we will try to look at today is the, the, the setup with the priests. And then hopefully some concluding thoughts if uh, all goes well. Um, but <clears throat> um, the um, so while he's on the mountain, while he's receiving these instructions, you know he's given all these details of the the uh, construction of the tabernacle, and then he also gives all the details about the garments of the priest and how they are to be consecrated and how they are to serve to some extent. Um, of course, we will not have all the details of that now because I don't want to step on the toes of the next classes, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which will give a whole lot more detail about these things. But we'll, we'll go over at least the things that are discussed here in Exodus uh, and look at them in a little bit more detail. Um, so he, he gives the instructions on how and he, and he picks the people, the, the, this is going to be Aaron and his sons that are going to play this role of priests. 
Aaron will be the high priest, his son will be priest, and then his sons will succeed him as high priest going forward. Um, and so he will give, he's going to give the detail of how that is to be done. And this is no simple process. This is, everything about this is very detailed and very complicated. And so they had to be written down and taken care of because this was not an easy uh, thing to do. It wasn't a simple process. And so we're going to try to look at the detail of some of that. And so we're given a whole lot of detail about the garments, especially the high priest. So let's take a few minutes and look at that. Uh, just like the tabernacle, there were several layers, there were several pieces to this ensemble that Aaron was to wear. And um, I never really thought that I would be showing a picture of boxer shorts in Bible class, but that's basically what we've got. We, this is um, the, 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 the first layer was the, they called them uh, linen breeches or linen um, trousers or whatever the case might be, but they were um, basically boxer shorts. Uh, it says they went from the hips to the thighs. Um, and then, and I'll be referring to Josephus a little bit when, during this discussion because he gives a pre pretty detailed account of this. Uh, he, he's going over this section. And while Josephus wasn't there all the way back, he was first century and he was a historian and he had access to sources that we don't have access to anymore. And so he's a pretty, pretty good resource to look at. We, you know, he's not scripture, he's not inspired, but he's a really good source to take, take a look at and maybe get some details. And he's pretty consistent with the scriptures, maybe with a few more details added in. Um, and so uh, I read this section of his uh, 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 Antiquities of the Jews. Uh, it's in book three, if you're curious. Uh, the, uh, and so he get, kind of fills in some things. And so he says that this was actually you know, uh, a, a garment that you had to step into with both legs. So that kind of gives you an idea of kind of the, the boxer short type thing. Now the purpose of this was that it was to cover their nakedness while performing their duties. So this lets you know that God takes covering the nakedness seriously. It was profane. It was something that could really defile their work as priests. And so we had these precautions put in place uh, to make sure that, um, that that was covered, that their nakedness was covered. And, uh, and we don't have time to go into all of it right now, but this is a really good place for us to take a look and to make considerations as we consider what we are to wear. Uh, when we think about um, where... Uh, what we need to cover and what we need to do in order to be to cover our nakedness and uh, you know in modesty studies and things so the priests a couple other places we can look at in regards to the garments of the priest to kind of help us develop uh, what uh, how we may need to uh, look at things as we try to choose how we present ourselves and our clothing so that's the linen breeches or trousers that um, that they were to wear underneath uh, their clothing uh, the next layer, of course, different translations will say, use different words along the way, but the next one, the next layer would be like a tunic or a coat. Um, this is, um, this was also uh, made of linen. Um, and it says, uh, let's see, I think the King James Version says embroidered. Um, New American Standard says checked pattern. Uh, this picture, I know you can't see it on the screen, but this picture actually has, if you could see it, you know, on a computer screen like I was seeing it earlier, it actually has a kind of a checkered pattern in kind of a, in that um, linen. And so there was some kind of pattern in this layer uh, of the linen uh, built in. Uh, and Josephus mentions that this was something that went all the way down to the feet. You know, he would have seen the priest of his day. You know, the priests were still practicing this. And so he would have seen the priest of his day. So that's what he would have been looking at, the priest of the first century. And he says this, you know, this went all the way to the feet, had kind of tight sleeves, and uh, so you know, it just kind of served as a good uh, base layer there for the rest of the garments. Um, and so, uh, and he also mentions that it was embroidered uh, with flowers uh, with the different color threads there. All right. Our next layer uh, is a, a robe called a robe. This was blue. It actually says what color it is. It says this one was actually blue. Um, it was worn over the tunic or coat. Um, and it just it's, goes out of its way to mention the fact that it, the neck area was reinforced so to make sure that it didn't tear. You know, it, had, it was like it was hemmed. It had embroidery around uh, to make sure that it was 
uh, you know, good and strong and could take weight. And we'll see why it might need that uh, here in a little bit. But, um, but it was this tunic, it went over, um, this robe went over uh, this, uh, the, the, the tunic. And then at the bottom, in the tassel, kind of where you'd have tassels, it would alternate between bells and pomegranates. And the bells uh, served uh, a bit of a purpose there. It says that uh, the bells were to make noise as he entered the holy place. And the text says that this is so that he will not die. Now some, some translations will say, lest he die. So I'll open it up real quick. What do you think? What, 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 what do you think this, these bells were all about? Were they to keep him from dying or... Any thoughts? Be just like obedience. Be just like what? It's obedience. This is what God designed it for. And if they weren't there, it would be disobedient. Yeah, so that's the obvious. I mean, God commanded it to be there. And so, um, now what I, I've heard before, I don't know. But I, I, I'm, I'm, this is just something I've, I've heard before and kind of always had in the back of my mind. And then as I read through the text, I didn't read it exactly that way this time. But it still could be a possible. But, you know. This was serious work the high priest was doing. And if he made a mistake, what very much could happen? Yeah, and so we've, you know, so he's out, he's in the, he's in the tabernacle doing his duties. And, you know, you're hearing him walking around, you're hearing the bells, and then no bells. You know, we know we've got a problem. We've got a, uh, you know, <laughs> he's made a mistake. Something's happened. We need to tend to this. Um, and I, I, there's probably no truth to this, whatever, but it seems somewhere in my memory, it was like they had a, a, a rope tied to him somewhere, you know, as he would go in to where if they ever heard the bell stop, they could pull him back out. But I, I could just be completely making that up. So don't, I probably shouldn't even mention it. That's how insignificant my memory is on that. But anyway, but the bells were there and it says they were to make a sound. Uh, so that they would know, you know, they could hear him as he's doing his duties as he went in and out of the holy place. Um, and so as he's doing his things, they would hear the tingle, uh, tinkle of the bells. Um, but whatever the case is, this is what was commanded. And so this was on uh, this layer of clothing. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, he's in there, so. Yeah, he's not just right. standing there. He's right. going about his duties, taking care of, 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 of God's business in there. But yeah, wondering what the bell is, uh, where do you think the pomegranate is? Well, I think that was purely decorative. I mean, that, that, the pomegranate was the normal, <laughs> it was a common uh, decoration, just like the cherubim, cherubim were inside the, uh, the inner layer of the tabernacle. You know, the pomegranate is something that was carved into their, their things a lot. And so, and then the, there will be pomegranates elsewhere in the uniform as well. All right. Right, yeah, and, and the same deal with the, the, uh, the folks that were over the tabernacle and all, you know, they were inspired, that skill. I mean, they might have had some natural born, for lack of a better term, but, but God inspired them. The Holy Spirit was involved with these skills that they used, yes. Um, and, um, and by the way, so one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is um, it says that the purpose of these garments were for beauty and glory. And, and so, you know, they were to be, this was to look extravagant. This was to look, I don't mean it degrading here, but fancy. You know, it's to look nice and, and purposeful. And, and so, uh, you know, we see these recreations uh, of just how people think it would look, but I have a feeling if we were able to see what they actually made, we would be thoroughly impressed and it would, it would look nice, it would look tasteful, it would look 
um, you know, like something holy. It's like something on purpose. So, all right. So our next uh, piece is a little more um, has a little more character to it here, and this would be the ephod. Um, I'm a as as I'm reading through it, I'm seeing it kind of. You would put it on kind of like a poncho. You know, it'd be like a uh, you know a a length of cloth that has a hole in the middle. You put it over your head, you know, it falls in the front, falls in the back. Um, and then you would gird it with a belt. Then it says that this belt or girdle was a special girdle. It had a, 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 a nice design to it. It was a similar to, uh, uh, kind of similar to the material of the ephod. Um, but I think some translations would call it a curious girdle. Uh, so it was kind of, it was a, it was a neat, interesting, it stood out. It was a girdle that stood out that you would wrap around and you would bind um, both sides of the um, ephod with this girdle um, or belt. The, um, um, now the two pieces, it said, you know, two pieces the front and the back, and they were joined together at the shoulder. And then on this shoulder, uh, they were to place uh, the uh, onyx stones, one on each shoulder. And then on, on each shoulder was six names of the sons of Jacob to represent the 12 tribes. And so this was uh, in order to, uh, this was to represent that the high priest bore the tribes to God as a memorial. And so it was like, you know, this is where you bear loads is on your shoulders. And so these, these uh, the tribes were inscribed on these stones on his shoulders. And so he would then present them to God and would bear them uh, to God. And so... They were joined together. Uh, the, the ephod was joined together with those uh, onyx stones. Um, and y'all forgive me on the pronunciation of the precious stones. I, I don't exactly deal with them every day, so <laughs> I, I don't know all of them. Um, but um, so um, it, now it was made of threads of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet. Now this gold thread, this was not golden colored thread. This was literally gold thread. Uh, chapter 39 verse 2 lets us know that. They actually had sheets of gold that they would cut into strips and made, made this thread from. So, you know, obviously the, that would not be what was providing the strength. It was interwoven because, you know, gold's not very strong, but it would be interwoven with all the others, you know. So you got gold filaments running all through this, this garment. So what does that tell you about this garment? It's expensive. And by the way, I meant, to, I meant to actually add up the cost of the tabernacle, the, of just the precious metals, and put it into that, and I, I failed to do that. But somebody has done that, and uh, it's in the extremely high millions, by the way. So there is no expense spared when we're talking about uh, these, these clothes or the tabernacle. Um, but it's that same color scheme that we have uh, with uh, this common in the tabernacle with the gold, the blue, the, the purple, and the scarlet. Um, this is just one idea of how that might have been, how that might have been done. Uh, it could have been in stripes. It could have been, you know, different patterns, different um, embroidery. I don't know. But however it was done, these were the colors that would have been involved. And, of course, the gold thread in there. All right. So... Now, that, right there, we saw in the middle where, the, where this was at. This is the breast piece uh, that would be uh, attached to the ephod. Now, this, is this, this, is, this piece is very, very significant. Um, this was about a nine inch by nine inch uh, square. It was two layers in order to form a pocket. You know, you, put, you fold it and, you, and sew it up, and so you end up with a pocket. Um, inside this pocket, was the, um, the, well, we'll talk about that in just a second. So let's talk about the stones first. So you see here we got four rows of three stones, and these are all precious stones. And so we've got 12 of them, so what do you think they represent? The, the, the tribes, the sons of Jacob. And so we've got a stone for each one. Each, each tribe is assigned a stone in this uh, arrangement. Uh, of course, we're in order of birth, and um, and this is called the breast piece, the breastplate of judgment. So, in other words, this high priest is going to serve a role of judgment to the people as well as some of his other roles. 
And so we talked about the pocket. So inside the pocket, we had um, two things. I don't know if they were necessarily, they could have been stones, I'm not real sure, but the Urim and the Thummim, all right? And uh, this was, th these stones were used in order to get communication from God in some shape, form, or fashion. So one example of a way people have thought of it is like maybe they were real similar in weight and shape, but they were different colors, you know, maybe white and black, something like that. And so they were in this pocket. So they would ask God a question, and then they'd reach in, and they'd pull out the black to represent yes, the white no, or vice versa, or whatever the case might be. Um, but that way, they would receive God's judgment based on these two stones. It was a way to kind of get a good binary answer from God, a yes or a no. Um, and so we see examples of this uh, being used a couple times through Scripture. Um, but so, you, you know, the people had their judges. Remember how things were set up uh, when Jethro came and talked to Moses about how to kind of set up a hierarchy of, of judgment. You know, you had the ones over different groups of sizes and then eventually it would come to Moses. Well, now Moses is not the one making these final judgments anymore. Now we're told the high priest is your Supreme Court. That is the final line of judgment uh, to find out, you know, what the word of God is. This is how... You would find out, and then later the kings would actually go to the high priest, go to the high priest to consult with God, um, if you know they didn't have a prophet. Uh, you know, some of them we had prophets that were there, but uh, you know th this would be one way to consult God on matters of you know, do I go to war or not? You know, and we get the the, the, the Urim and the Thummim, Thummim, and we can get an answer from God uh, that way. Uh, and so that's why this, this breastplate is then called the, the breastplate uh, or breastpiece of judgment. And it was to rest right over his heart. Uh, some of the illustrations I saw had it kind of down here, but it clearly says it was to rest over his heart. So it would have been up here on the, across the chest uh, covering uh, his heart. Um, <clears throat> and so that is, um, that is the breastpiece. And it was kind of the feature item. Of, of the of the ensemble that he would be wearing at this point. All right, uh, the final piece to describe would be the the well the hat for lack of a better term. Uh, it's called a mitre turban. Uh, a couple different things. This was a this was of linen as well. Um, and um, of course, if you want more details of what it might have been, you know, you, you might look at uh, Joe Cephas. He has some more details about it, but it was a, a turban of linen, and then fastened to this linen was a gold plate that would be up there, and it was fastened, you can see it in this picture, of with, there was a blue um, rope or string of some, some shape, form or fashion that would fasten it to it, uh, and on this gold plate was, inscript, was the inscription, holy to the Lord. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So what, what's being holy to the Lord here? What is that describing? Yeah, but what is it referring to? I would think so. This, 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 this person, this office is set apart for the service of God. This is, this, this, you know, we know men aren't perfect, but the position, the, the, the office is there set apart, is set apart as holy to the Lord. And so just kind of uh, a fitting, a fitting description or inscription um, for the whole uh, thing we've got there. All right, and then of course the uh, now this was the, that that describes the high priest, and then uh, well, there's just kind of a, a another depiction, kind of labeling everything and the whole ensemble together. But the this would be uh, this was a decent rendition, I thought, of to kind of give you an idea of the difference with the the regular priest. Uh, I see some. Uh, some things I don't know that I would necessarily see right with the high priest, but the the but you see the plain, the one that's in more of a plain clothes. It was kind of similar. You know, we had the same base layers. We had the the linen breeches. We had the the tunic, but then we stopped there. So it's a lot simpler. But we do have the nice girdle that goes around the the the, the curious girdle, as some uh, say, some translations say. And so uh, you, they were easily distinguished between the high priest and then the rest of the priest. All right. So 
That is the garments of our priest. Uh, uh, any, any questions or comments or thoughts at this particular moment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe it's going to be in the, some of the other uh, places. But yeah, when they climbed, it would make sure. Well, and then we also talked about it when, uh, with, about the altar. You know, it had the, the steps. And so they want, you know, they want to make sure they didn't have any steps or something to that effect to make sure that nothing uh, was exposed at that point. Anything else? Okay. And I'm actually going, I'm going to give you all a minute to, when we're going to talk some Hebrews. But yes, yes. So, so yeah, keep that, keep that in mind. Anything else before we kind of move, move forward a little bit? Not to spoil Leviticus, but be holy for I am holy, right? So we'll, and we'll, yeah, we'll hit that a little bit more in just a minute. All right, so let's look at the consecration uh, process of the priest. Um, so once these garments were made, uh, the priests were to be uh, consecrated before they were able to allow, before they were allowed to serve. So there was, a, in other words, there was a lot of preparation that had to happen just for the priest to be able to do their duties. And so we're going to look uh, briefly at that. Uh, process. And so here's just kind of a, a depiction. Of course, we know it's Moses because we've got the Charlton Heston uh, robe there. But um, anyway, so uh, there was a whole process that we had to go through. So they, uh, Aaron and his sons were brought to the tabernacle. Uh, it says they were bathed uh, with water. Um, Aaron then goes through the process of putting on his garments. There's a specific order that all that is done, that his garments are put on. Um, he's anointed with oil. And now, is this just some regular old olive oil? That's right. Exactly right. And the, this exact recipe is given to us as well. It's there. There's a specific recipe, and that's exactly right, that we had that designation that this was not to be used for anything else. This was for anointing. And so this is the, the, the oil that they're anointed with this oil. Um, <clears throat> uh, Aaron's sons are then to be clothed with, with their garments. Uh, they bring in uh, a couple of animals. So for the first one, they, they have a bull, and it has to be a bull without blemish. Uh, they put their hands on the bull, and then it's slaughtered. They take some of the blood, they put it on the horns of the altar, uh, and then, uh, and I may leave out a couple little details. I have to depend on you to do some reading to get to all the details. But, uh, but that, that's, that's part of what's done with the blood, is put on the altar. Um, and then there's uh, various parts, such as the, the internal fat, the liver, the kidneys. All that is offered uh, in smoke. Uh, as a smoke uh, uh, um, uh, on the altar, actually on the altar and, and offered. The rest of that animal is taken outside the camp and burned. And this is considered a sin offering. This is called a sin uh, offering with the bull. Uh, two rams are also brought. Uh, these are yearling rams without blemish. <clears throat> uh, the first ram, their hands are laid on the ram. Uh, then it's slaughtered. Its blood is then sprinkled on the altar. It's then cut into pieces. Uh, it's all it's completely washed, uh, the inside and out, and then is offered as a burnt offering, uh, as a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. Uh, so this is a th this was called a, a burnt uh, offering. Um, and then the second ram is brought. The hands are placed on this ram. It's slaughtered, but this time the blood is placed on the right ears, the thumbs, and the big toes of the priests uh, in order to um, 
consecrate them. Um, and then, then they take a little bit more of that blood from the second realm. They mix it, mix it with the anointing oil. And then that is put onto the garments and the priests themselves in order to consecrate them uh, for their service. Uh, and there's uh, some, some details along with the, uh, or, or the, excuse me, I'm trying not to get too confused. Um, but the fat from this realm, along with uh, some specific breads uh, and wafers, or unleavened wafers and things are, are put together. And that is then, um, uh, they put this in the hands of Aaron and his sons and they, they wave it some, in some shape, form, or fashion. It's considered a wave offering to the Lord and then it's burnt and it says that the smoke offers a pleasing aroma uh, to God. And so um, then the breast of this, of this particular ram is then also done, uh, treated as a wave offering, but this is actually given to the priest as their portion. This is, some, this is how they, uh, a part of how they got their sustenance and things like this. So this was a part of what was given uh, to them. And this second ram is called the ram of ordination. So this is the ordaining uh, process of, of what we're going through with, uh, Aaron uh, and his sons. So all this, like I said, I didn't give every detail. This was just kind of a, an overview. So please read, look at it. it it's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and then if you really want the details, check out Josephus <laughs> and his comments on his commentary on this. Um, but um, this process now happens for seven days. I'm kind of understanding it is that we go through this same process for seven days, I don't know, or, or it takes seven days. I, I don't know what exactly which way that would be. But whatever the process is, this consecration of the, the priest, this de dedication of them is to last uh, seven days. And then it mentions that this office will be passed forward or passed down to Aaron's sons uh, throughout the generation. So when we have a new high priest come in, we have new priests that we have to go through uh, this process uh, to get them ready. Um, now, y'all will be going through this in detail greatly going forward with Leviticus numbers and everything, but uh, as far as details of the sacrifice. But what it mentions here is that there will be continual sacrifices every day, uh, a yearling lamb in the morning as well as in the evening uh, sacrificed uh, every day that the priest uh, will be uh, administering uh, as their normal duties. This is, this is a bloody process. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if that, that was even done or if it was just kind of stacked on. But um, <clears throat> whatever the case, this was, this was not a clean <laughs> process. Um, and so you can imagine later in Jerusalem when you had everybody bringing things in the city. And these same processes were happening then, too. Uh, Yes. So, which is our perfect segue. Um, so, as, as you wrap up a class like this, it would be really, really nice to be able just to go right into Hebrews. And uh, oddly enough, both adult classes are studying Hebrews right now. Uh, up to that, they're wrapping up um, this week upstairs, and then I think y'all just came into Hebrews down here. Uh, in the last couple of weeks as well. Um, but so that might be beneficial uh, as we're going through is, is to take a look at Hebrews. Um, so those of you that have Hebrews in your mind, be, have that churning uh, as we ask these next couple of questions. So like we said, this was not a simple process. This was very complicated and it's even more complicated than what, how I spelled it out today. But what was the purpose? Why, why did we have to go through all this? I mean, because we, we know the final picture, right? We know Jesus. We, we know about Jesus. And it, things are a lot simpler with Jesus, right? Or is it? All right, so what's your thoughts on that? What is, um, why, why do you think God had them go through all this? Now this this section is y'all's. Just, just like the Old Testament was a tutor to lead us to Christ, all of these symbols would tell them what's coming, and so that they'd be able to recognize it when the real came. They were hooked. 
One of you. Yeah, I mean, the old law is considered a tutor. Remember, you know, when we see Paul's writings later, he calls it a tutor. And he's talking about the law. And, and this, we're, 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 this is the law, what we're dealing with here. And so uh, it, it teaches us so much. And one thing it teaches us is what sin does to our relationship with God. And what it takes to reconcile that. And that is blood. Now, you know, we all know the blood of bulls and goat can't take away sin. But this was teaching us what it took. The mess that is made, Hank, and so that, that, that what it, in order for us to get back with God, it teaches us. It, it, it God has never changed, right? I mean, some of the things that we do now have changed thanks to Jesus, but God has never changed. The same things that dealt with sin back then are what deals with sin now. Jesus is the difference, and so it teaches us. It actually, it's the tutor that brings us to understand uh, Christ. Um, the other piece of this is that it set that nation apart. Remember, this was a holy nation. It was something different. And so it set them apart. But, uh, but I think the big thing was teaching us and being a shadow of the things that come. That's the language that's used quite a bit. This is a shadow. You know, you don't get the full picture in a shadow. You get an outline. You get a, a rough, but you don't get the fullness. You don't get the full picture. And so the old law was a, was a shadow of, of, of what would come under Christ. Um, and also, yeah, you mentioned the, you know, the perpetual nature of these sacrifices. This is something that had to be done constantly, just kept having to happen, kept, kept going on. Uh, you know, certain ones were once a year, some, one, some were every day, some were just every time uh, you, you sinned and had to do something with it. And so it was help us to help us understand the inadequacy of what we could do. You know, there's, we could not do these things ourselves. There, there's no way we could keep this law Ourself, and so there was no way that we could justify ourselves. Did you have something, Leon? Well, just a couple of verses to those. <coughs> your, your son got Hebrews, and the purpose of this Hebrews 8 5 uses that expression to serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things. Chapter 10 and verse 1 the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things. So these are verses. Yeah, so I appreciate it. So if you're taking notes, there's those, those references. All right. He's always what? Pat, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. He's always got a pattern and makes it understood. Um, So all of this served a purpose, an ultimate purpose, bringing us to Christ. All right, so I've got one minute. So what I want to do in that one minute is make sure we kind of understand the chronology because we kind of got off in the details, and for good reason, we got kind of off in the details, uh, and we did all that, but I want to make sure that we understand uh, where we are in the chronology uh, of things. So um, the people uh, arrived at Mount Sinai the third month after leaving uh, Egypt. The law is orally given. It's ratified. Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days. Remember we had the whole uh, calf incident during that. And then Moses ends up back on, back on the mountain for 40 more days. And six months are then spent uh, building the tabernacle, making the priest for the garments, getting all that set up. All right. Now the first day of the second year, the tabernacle is set up. You know, we've been prepping, getting everything built and ready for it. And now on the, second, the first day of the second year, the tabernacle is then set up. Uh, we have seven days of consecration for the priest. 
And on the eighth day of the second year, Aaron and his sons begin their work as priests. And then, as we will see uh, going forward, uh, we will leave Sinai on the 20th day of the second month of the second year. So we've been here roughly a year We have here at Sinai. And so uh, when they leave Sinai, they have a king, they have a law. So what are they? They're a nation. The nation promise is now fulfilled. Now we need to go get the land, right? And so we'll be dealing with that later. Now, I, I know we're out of time, but I do want to read this real quick. This is.
Welcome, everyone. It's encouraging to see everyone out this morning, and as we begin our period of worship to God this morning, I want to, uh, as we always do, remind about uh, devices and silencing our devices, which I'll do right now. And let's uh, be aware of what we're about to do. Let's worship God. And we're so grateful to be here and to help us prepare our minds. I'll read a brief passage and then we'll be led in our opening prayer. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, this morning, humble and grateful for the grace that you show to us and that you showed through, through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice he made on the cross, the same sacrifice that enabled our salvation and enabled us to have the fellowship that we do this morning as we gather to you. And we pray that as we worship you today, we do so in a way that is pleasing to you and that humbles our minds and our hearts and that we can carry with us through the rest of the week. Dear Lord, we pray that you be with the members of this congregation here, uh, particularly ones that are going through a hard time, either spiritually or mentally or physically. We pray that you be with our sister Cindy and her loss of Stanley, and that you be with her and comfort her throughout this time and help us to help with that. We're thankful for seeing Brother Daryl back with us today, and we pray that you be with him as he continues to recover. We pray that you also be with Larry Brooks in the same way and with Brady Graves and with, with all the others here, Lord, that have ongoing health issues, and that you be with them and help us to help them in a way that, that is beneficial. We come to you grateful today also for the new fellowship we have with our new brother Jude and with his coming to Christ. And we're, we pray that as he goes forward in his walk that we be encouraging to him and that we help strengthen each other and all serve you in a way that's, that's pleasing to you. We pray that you be with us through the rest of the service. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Let's turn to number 186. 186. Uh, the songs that we'll sing are here up on this board in case you're using your book. Uh, we're just going to sing the first, second, and third stanzas, not the fourth. No, no, so I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How 
if you're using your song books and you want to mark the song of invitation, it will be number 322. 322, Bring Christ Your Broken Life. Let's sing 420, O Thou, o thou Fount of Every Blessing. We're going to sing the first and last verses of this song. What a joy it is to be again before you this morning. I think we all agreed that our gospel meeting this past Sunday through Wednesday was very uplifting and edifying and uh, rendered glory unto God. And as I said uh, at uh, one point Wednesday night, I guess, if we can just take that encouragement with us and build on that, build on that momentum. That's always a good thing. So we appreciate our brother Gary and the good work God did through him among us. We're very blessed to have him. And we have visitors this morning. We are thankful for your presence and we want you to always feel welcome. And it's so good to have our sister Mildred home where she belongs and David and Jeannie with us. 
You know, they join us, I guess, every Sunday with the live stream, all the way from California. And so um, that's one good use that is made of the, uh, the, the streaming service and a couple of hours difference in the time, but they work that out and are able to, to join us, and we appreciate that. Well, Russell selected some uh, good songs, and when we think in terms of the one just before the lesson, that leads us so well into our topic for today. We've been talking this month about God's amazing grace, His marvelous grace, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, that's where the blood of the Lamb was shed. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive? And I think we're all still rejoicing about Jude's obedience to the gospel this past Wednesday night. That's the case of God's marvelous grace being received. And Devin, I appreciate your encouragement and uh, your assisting Jude as you did to help him render obedience to the gospel. And those of us that were here greatly rejoiced in witnessing that. So thus far this month we've, we've had lessons entitled, The True Grace of God, using that expression from 1 Peter chapter 5. We've also looked at one very important aspect of the way God has made us, and that is we've looked at man's free will, which is something that is denied by many people. And though we've not been trying to explore all the error about grace of necessity when you teach the true grace of God you have to contrast that which is erroneous. We've also spent time talking about justification by grace and how God who loves us but also who abhors sin can justify we all of whom have sinned and there's only one way. And Paul shows how lost we are because of sin and deserving the wrath of God in Romans 1, 2, and 3. But then he talks about the justification that is by grace. And it's because of the propitiation of the blood of Jesus Christ as he explores in the third chapter. In our last lesson, which was a couple of Sunday nights ago, we talked about God's conditions of grace. Again, a common misunderstanding is that grace is... It's unconditional that if you have to do anything at all, if, if man does any, makes any response, that's works. And we know salvation is not by works. And so we've talked about the fact that God's grace may have conditions, whatever conditions He sets. And we gave several examples of God bestowing a blessing, but it was conditional upon grace. In these lessons, we've learned how that God's unmerited favor that provides redemption through the blood of Christ is available to all. We've looked at Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. We've also seen that the grace of God teaches us. That same passage goes on to say, teaching us, verse 12. And so the teaching is done through the gospel. Isaiah, or I should say Jeremiah 31 looking ahead to the new covenant, said they shall all be taught of God. We've seen that grace excludes human merit. We cannot earn our salvation. And Jesus said in Luke 17 and verse 10, when we've done all that we're commanded to do, that we're to say we're unprofitable servants. But that's one of those things, nobody does that. Nobody has done all that we're commanded to do. But Jesus said, even if that were the case, we still have nothing of which to boast. And so we've stressed that God's grace of salvation is received at the point of gospel obedience. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? 
Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And this is in a book that's been talking about salvation by grace, salvation by faith. But he's talking here about that point in time that we enter into Christ, that we receive the blessing of salvation. And that's when one obeys the gospel of Christ. That's further developed in chapter 6 and verse 17. And this would tie in with our brother Gary's lesson on I am a slave. And he did such a good job explaining that and what he meant and what the Bible means by that. But in Romans 6 and verse 17, thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, the word form there is pattern, to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So Again, we're talking about the grace that saves, the blood of Christ, amazing grace, grace that is greater than all of our sin. And it's right to ask at what point does God's grace save us? At what point are we saved by grace, by faith? And this tells us specifically, it's at that point of gospel obedience, if there's that transition, no longer a slave of sin. Satan is a cruel master. He desires our destruction. He desires our eternal ruin. No longer slaves of sin, but now slaves of righteousness with one who loves us, with one who calls us friends, with one who forgives us and blesses us. And so that that point is made, Paul says. You were slaves of sin, now you're slaves of righteousness. When did that take place? He says, when you obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine under which you were delivered. So all these passages are helpful to us in understanding truth about the grace of God. And the thing about the grace of God is, not only do we enter into that saved state by the grace of God at that point when we become a Christian, but grace is something that we must continue in. Notice the the wording in Acts chapter 13. In Acts 13 and verse 34, The text says that through many trials that we must uh, that we must continue in in the grace of God. Second Corinthians six and verse one says to receive not the grace of God in vain. And so again, th- there must be a continuation in the grace of God. But I want to this morning. I want to consider, if I may, with you, the book of Hebrews. The lesson this morning, building on what we have said, we want to to look at grace and the Christian in view of several other passages of Scripture. We've referenced John, the first chapter, which talks about our receiving grace upon grace. And I'm wanting to look at several passages with you this morning. And we'll take these in order in the book of Hebrews, if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews 2, the Bible says in verse 9 that we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste of death for every man. John 3.16 talks about the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But here in Hebrews 2 verse 9, that he by the grace of God should taste death, some translations say for every man. The New King James says for every one, but it individualizes it. And again, as uh, our brother Bill at the Lord's table this morning mentioned, it's not that we can fully apprehend this, that we can fully comprehend this, but we should try. And to just think that by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for you individually. He tasted death for me individually. He tasted death for every one. The book of Hebrews has a lot to say about grace. It's it's a book that is encouraging Christians that are faltering. Uh, The ones he's writing have not quit entirely, but they might. They're in danger. He's writing people that have lost their focus. He's writing to people that have lost their joy in serving the Lord. 
It, it could go either way from them. And so you have interspersed throughout the book warnings that deal with that, but there's also encouragement, there, and there's also the effort to refocus their attention. And what does he focus it on? Well, on Jesus Christ, but on the grace of God. In chapter 4, are you discouraged? Verse 14, are trials getting you down? Thinking about give, giving up? And so we read in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points was tempted as we are. Now verse 16, let us come, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. Don't you find that encouraging? That the throne of God, you think of His great power, you think of His awesome, uh, I mean, He is omnipotent, He's omniscient, He's omnipresent, and all of that, as we've recently studied about the divine nature, and all that's true. What's His throne called? Is it called a throne of wrath? Here the text calls it a throne of grace. And we're encouraged to come boldly. The word boldly doesn't mean recklessly or carelessly or irreverently because we must approach God with reverence that is due His name. He is an awesome God. But boldly means with the confidence that a child can approach his father who loves him. Because again, as our brother Gary mentioned, we can cry, Abba, Father. There's that intimate relationship and He wants us to come before the throne. Why? To receive mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. And so the throne is called the throne of grace. But let's look at one of those warning passages. Still in the book of Hebrews, we turn to the 10th chapter in Hebrews chapter 10. The writer is encouraging them to do things that will help them to, build, to be built up, to be steadfast. And, and part of that is in the in verses, for example, in Hebrews, the, the 10th chapter, uh, verses such as verse 23, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Well, that's encouraging. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That's encouraging. God is always faithful. Hold on. And then what we can do with each other in verse 24, let us consider one another to, in order to stir up love and good works. And a large part of doing that is what we're doing right here, right now, this morning. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So all of this is preventative. All of this is uh, positive. All of that is to build each other up to strengthen our faith, but that prefaces what comes next, which is a warning. What if we don't do that? What if we're careless about that? What if we don't regard the sacrifice of Christ as we should and come to Him for salvation as this book is about? What if we seek a, a relationship with God some other way or, or just abandon that relationship with God? Verse 26 says, If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. In contrast, verse 28, anyone who's rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of a covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Well, the passage goes on. We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, that's why we need to take the encouragement passages seriously. That's why we need to do the things that are under consideration to build one another up as well as to maintain our own faith. Our own faith needs maintenance. We need strengthening. But again, if that's cast aside, 
And by the way, in verse 26, if we sin willfully, may I say, what that's not saying, if you sinned and you knew better than that, you have no hope. Many times when one sins, he knew that was wrong. He, he knew better. Again, context is always important. Here he's talking about people that are rejecting the Christ, rejecting the faith. Whether it's going back to Judaism or, or whatever, they're not being, the point is they're not being faithful to the Lord. So it's not a, a single transgression. It's not the fact that they, they committed a sin but they knew it was wrong ahead of time so there's no hope. He's not saying that. And I say that because I know some people have misunderstood the passage. The sinning willfully here is when one is turning aside from the Christ. One is becoming unfaithful to the Christ. And what do you need to do in a case like that? Sometimes people say, well, I know I need to get back in church. Does that reflect what verse 29 says has happened? What one is doing by unfaithfulness is trampling the Son of God underfoot. He's counting the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. And as pertains specifically to our lesson, he's doing despite to the Spirit who is here called the Spirit of grace. That's what needs to be repented of. Not just the fact that one has missed services. And we need to see the gravity of what one is doing when he does become unfaithful to the Lord. But again, involved in the things that are listed there, involved in the matters that are listed there, it pertains to our point of grace, how that the Spirit is called not just the Holy Spirit, which He is, but He's the Spirit of grace. And that just covers so much. I mean, in the beginning, when you first hear about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God brooded upon the face of the waters. You see the Spirit of grace, Rocky, in the, in the tabernacle with, with, uh, with, with the men that were inspired to, to oversee the work, the craftsmen and all that. You, you see Him throughout the Old Testament. You see Him coming on the day of Pentecost. But not only that, you see the Spirit of grace helping us to bear the fruit of the Spirit to God's glory. And you see the Spirit of grace in Romans chapter 8 when we pray and we don't find the words to say what we would like to express and the Spirit intercedes for us on our behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. He's the Spirit of grace. The Spirit and the bride say, come. From Genesis to Revelation, He's the Spirit of grace. And this passage is saying, do you want to do despite to the Spirit of grace? Let's move on to chapter 12. I'm talking about grace right now in the book of Hebrews. We're calling the lesson this morning, Grace and the Christian. Because that's what these verses deal with. In chapter 12... Again, you have a, a similar pattern. Words that encourage. All of chapter 11 should encourage us. This, this hall of faith. The, the first several verses of chapter 12 are to encourage us. Verse 12 says, Hebrews 12 verse 12, Strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and holiness without which men no one shall see the Lord. So would you, would you say that that's, that's encouragement, that's exhortation to, to strengthen, to be strengthened and to see our role uh, in, in uh, again, maintaining our faith and helping one another. But what does the next verse say? Verse 15 says, looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this the many be defiled. Now here are people who are Christians. Numerous times he's, he's addressing them as brethren, wherefore holy brethren. And so you, you have that kind of uh, uh, chapter 10 verse 19, therefore brethren having boldness to enter. So throughout the book there's no question and when by reason of time you ought to be teachers, chapter 5 says. So there's no question we're, we're talking to, we're talking about people that are Christians. And I say that because sometimes someone says, well, if someone were to fall away, that just shows he wasn't a Christian to start with. Well, that's a cop-out. These people were Christians. And if that weren't the case, that should have been pointed out. You weren't Christians to start with. You need to obey the gospel properly, scripturally. That's never said. 
But these who are Christians are warned, lest in verse 15 they fall short of the grace of God. I was reading the ESV on that. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. But these are Christians. They've obtained the grace of God in terms of remission from past sins. But it's not enough to say, I've been baptized. He's talking here in this book about what you do after you're baptized. He's talking about what God wants of those who are His people. And He's warning His people lest you fall short of the grace of God. And notice also, I hope you don't get tired of me saying consider the context. But in the same verse that warns us about falling short or failing to obtain the grace of God, he goes on to say, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. In other words, your attitude of bitterness, even though there's a root of bitterness, it can spring up and it can defile. That state of bitterness in the heart can cause you to fall short, to fail to obtain the grace of God. You know, there is such a thing as righteous indignation. And we're told to abhor what is evil to, and to cleave to what is good. And so there's, a, there's such a thing as a holy hatred for sin. There's such a thing as righteous indignation. But there's no such thing as righteous bitterness. And some people have allowed themselves to become embittered. And they just go through life stewing and, and rehearsing in their mind injuries, either real or perceived, and it just eats them up. But not only them uh, themselves, but the text says, and thereby the many be defiled. You see, your attitude of bitterness can set such a, uh, set such a bad example that you take others along with you. And so he's warning here of things that can cause us to fail of the grace of God. And by the way, along that line, we remind ourselves of Galatians 5 and verse 4, where Paul speaks of those who would seek to be justified by the law, and then he says, you are fallen from grace. So that settles the matter. One can fall from grace. The, the, some of the Galatians did. The Hebrew writer, this makes no sense if that's not a real possibility, and he's warning that. But the point is, it doesn't need to be that way. God doesn't want it to be that way. The writer didn't want it to be that way. It says you need to be aware this is what can happen. This is what your bitterness can do to you. This is what your secular mindset can do to you. He goes on to warn, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. We have a birthright. And it's possible for a Christian to sell his birthright and fall short of the grace of God. Still in this same chapter 12, Verse 28 says, Therefore, since we receive, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Just in terms of the kingdom that we're part of right now, as well as looking ahead to the eternal kingdom in its state of glory, let us have grace. It seems that in this context here, it's the idea of let us have gratitude. The ESV says, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I really like that thought. We have received grace from God. What should come from us? Grace. We should sing with grace. There should be hearts in our, our speech is to be with salt, seasoned with grace, that you may know how to answer everyone. We receive grace. We sing like people that have received grace. We receive grace. We talk like people that are the recipients of divine grace. And here in this passage, receiving the kingdom with grace, with gratitude. We, we reflect the grace of God that has been manifested among us. One final passage in the book of Hebrews is chapter 13 and verse 9. I don't know. Sometimes we say you save the best for last. And uh, it's not up to me to pass judgments on one passage being best in that sense. But... Well, to me, one of the best points in the book of Hebrews is made here in the last chapter. It's, it's one of those, it's kind of a summary passage. And Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9, Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, and not with foods which have not profited with those who have been occupied with them. 
And so he's been contrasting about the altar, those things that were a shadow of that which is to come, a shadow of the substance. And he's saying that's not the thing that strengthens. What strengthens the heart, it's good that the heart be established by grace. And so we, we, we define grace, as we said in the beginning, as God's unmerited favor. And we, we think of the redemptive work that is in Christ. And yet when it comes to this topic of the grace of God, there are many things that grow out of that so that we don't stop simply with a definition. We don't stop simply in seeing salvation from past sins. I want to mention a couple of other passages, if I may. In 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, a, a passage that's often considered um, when we're taking up the contribution. As, as Bill said this morning, from 1 Corinthians 16, every child of God, every child of God on the first day of the week is to give of his means. Let every one of you, the text says. We need to be diligent to do that. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he's talking about the descriptive terms uh, to sow bountifully, to sow cheerfully. But where I'm, where I'm coming from here in this chapter is that the word for grace, charis, the word for grace, the word charis is found ten times in these two chapters. That's a lot of grace. Now not every time is it rendered as grace. Sometimes it's rendered as gift. But many times it is rendered as grace. But again, looking at the context of 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1, Brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Here are churches that compared to the more affluent Corinthians were in verse 2, deep poverty. He said, I want to talk to you about grace. Because in verse 4, they implored us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Receive the chorus, the gift, the grace. And verse 5, this they did not as we hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. So verse 6, we urge Titus that he, as he had begun so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Last part of verse 7, see that you abound in this grace also. Look at all the grace we're seeing in this chapter. Just in the first seven verses, verse 1 is grace. Verse 5 is the word, verse 6 is the word grace. Verse 7 is the word grace. What's he talking about? The matter of giving. Do we look at it that way? Now we're told not, not to give grudgingly or, or of necessity, but repeatedly the, the concept of our giving financially in this context for the relief of needy saints. As Brother Bill said this morning, was, we have part in supporting not only with the local work here, but several gospel preachers in various places in the world. And the church has done that for many years. And so that's, so the contribution is for doing the work of the Lord as defined in Scripture, but repeatedly it's just called grace. And, and he does that some more, again, sometimes using the word, the word gift. But again in chapter 9, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you also having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. It's grace that you get to give. It's grace that you get to have fellowship in these things of the Lord. In verse 14, and their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Again, context is in their giving, in their contribution. I'm asking, do we look at it that way? Do we think what wonderful grace God has bestowed upon us Marvelous grace that we can have part. And to that end, we want to give in a way that reflects we're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And it's not an afterthought of some kind. <clears throat> Quickly, in the book of Philippians, the first chapter. In Philippians 1, Paul expresses his thanksgiving and his prayer for the Philippians. And he says in verse 7, Philippians 1, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. Well, what does that mean? You're partakers with me of grace. Well, they've been saved by grace. 
we have that in common. He's thankful for their fellowship from the first day until now. Do you know what that means? The first day? That's when Lydia said, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house. And Luke says, and she constrained us from the first day until now. In writing the book of Philippians, he had just received another gift for his evangelistic work from the Philippians. And they had supported him, he says, even in Thessalonica. Well, that's where he went when he first left Philippi, was Thessalonica. So right away, in Philippi, and when he left, and in points in between, they had had part in his, so their participation is, is that of the grace of God. But that doesn't exhaust it. Because you go on down, and he's still talking about grace and what's been granted. In verse 29, he says this, For to you it has been granted on, Christ, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. He says, you're partakers of grace with me. And that means the good, but it also means the bad. That means the salvation. That means the spiritual gifts. That, that meant the fellowship and the gospel. But he said, there's something else you've been granted to do. Not only to believe in Christ, not only to trust Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Do you see that as grace? As something that God allows us to do? Jesus did. You remember the, the last of the Beatitudes? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And He said to rejoice and be exceeding glad. When men speak evil of you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Great is your reward in heaven. Maybe a bit more difficult to see it, but that's grace too. And Paul says, you've heard this was in me, and now you're having the same conflict. You're partakers with me of grace. My final passage is 1 Peter 3, uh, 1 Peter 1, I meant to say. 1 Peter 1 and verse 13 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When by His grace I look on His face, that will be glory. Be glory for me. That's what this passage is talking about. Peter is not saying this will be your first experience of grace, but he's, he's talking about the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We receive grace now. Ephesians 2, saved by grace through faith, verse 8. We continue to receive grace in living the Christian life, the throne of grace, and so many other ways. But the best is yet to come. There's more to come. We're receiving grace upon grace, and we're to rest our hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Praise God for His amazing grace. Amen. Well, this morning, if you've not yet rendered obedience to the gospel, God's grace has been brought down. Jesus died for you. All things are ready. Bring Christ your broken life. So marred by sin. He will create a new, make whole again, as we stand and sing. Amen. Bring Christ your broken life.